to, I think, which is quite a meaty section around Shenmue 3. And the first question opens up with saying that fans are really, yeah, really delighted with the Kickstarter being announced for Shenmue 3 and love the elements such as the save Shenmue Hall, uh, which created that special connection with the fans. With Shenmue 3 now approaching its fifth anniversary, which is insane in itself, is how crazy. do you feel about the project's journey and outcome now that you can look back on it? Yeah, so like you say, the section on Shenmue 3 is quite meaty. I, I feel like Shenmue 3 was released and no one's particularly asked Yu Suzuki too many questions about the storyline and all that sort of stuff. It feels like a lot of the interviews kind of ended at 2019. I know we have had a, a few interviews with Yu Suzuki since, but um, I thought it might be nice to sort of probe him some, for some story content answers for some of the things that happened in Shenmue 3. So this first question just sort of try to get a, a feel of how Yu Suzuki felt about the, the project yeah, now that yeah. it's been and done. So he says, well, for me, Shenmue 1, 2, and 3 are game projects that are finished. So what I think about are the next games like 4 or 5. Although a remake of the first two games using something like Unreal Engine 5 might be fun if we had a partner <laughs> for it. <laughs> so that's a, quite a, a, a cool statement that he's he's, he's, he's also interested in a remake because remember that IGN interview he, he says like, oh, you know, be nice to do a Shemu Zero or a Shemu Four, and now he's talking about a remake as well. So um, <laughs> hopefully we get one of those three things. And then yeah. interestingly, he says that yesterday he was watching a YouTube gameplay video of what Shemu, where you have to find Mister Yukawa, and it made him want to try remaking it with Unreal Engine Five because it had its own flavor. So we've got Shemu Zero, a remake of Shemu, Shemu Four. And possibly a remake of what Shenmue on the cars, Matt. How do you feel about that? I mean, I'll take any Shenmue content <laughs> we can get. Um, Imagine an Unreal the, 5 engine version of what, what Shenmue. That'd be crazy. That'd be absolutely insane. But actually thinking, and I know there's been talk in the community around the idea and the feasibility around a full-scale remake, which I can understand the logic behind it. It's a massive risk. But mm. if they could get it off the ground and do it well modernize things really encompass maybe even Shenmue 1 and 2 into one game and then sort of give people an entry point it could potentially work we talk about Shenmue 0 later in this interview I also have the theory that that could work if it you know, had the, 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 the Yakuza 0 effect he's got lots of ideas I guess which is brilliant and I like that it's then which one of these ideas can he get past that stage into a full scale production that's I think the next stage and maybe something like a watch Shenmue or a small tech demo of Dabuita in Unreal could be that first step for him I I, I don't know good, uh, good point Matt like if they are looking for a partner for something like a remake if they did create watch Shenmue which is like a small bite sized chunk of what that remake would become and then sort of show that to potential partners in the future just so they can get a good idea of what uh, the idea might be behind this sort of remake and if it looks quality because it's in Unreal 5 uh, for example, that could be a good stepping stone for them to get a, a project like a remake off the ground, I guess We just have to see, don't we and also, it then depends on, on Sega, who obviously own the IP and there's other complications around it that mm. I'll come on to actually in this interview as well so I'll, I'll, I'll park, that, park that thought for a minute we then sort of pop into the next sort of follow-up question more than anything else. And you, you say it certainly fun, would be fun. I'd quite like to see it. With yep. many years of development between Shenmue 2 and 3, it must have been a challenge to keep track of the story and other details from earlier games. What process did you use to help preserve continuity between the two games? Yeah, which I thought was a good question just to sort of understand mm. what they did before they, you know, went deep into the story of Shenmue 3, for example, if how much of the continuity is going to be retained, what, what was the process there? And Yusuke came back and said that we used the 11 chapter novelized work as a reference point when creating the scenarios for the new game, so that avoided uncertainties. The novel has the complete story you see. He kind of is saying that the novel version of you know what they've got here is the entire saga, which yeah. is pretty crazy. And then you sort of go back to ask it, did it reduce the amount of time they needed to replay the games? And it was, his answer was quite straightforward here. He said that it was necessary to go back and play them um, to check certain things. But I 
get the impression it probably sped things up a little bit. Yeah, Is that fair? I thought so. I mean, you'd hope that they got or, or at least gone through both the games with a fine tooth comb just to sort of retain a lot of the, the continuity because I'm a sucker for continuity, really, which is why I wanted to ask that question just to get a feel of like what they are, are actually doing to, to keep games consistent and not kind of miss a, an important story beat um, or, or something that we feel is important anyway. So from an analytical point of view, they, it sounds like they've got the content in front of them in terms of the novel they've got the games yeah. so in terms of Shenmue 3 obviously we know there's certain continuity things he's answered some of that in terms of Shenhua's house the tapestry for example we got a straight answer from that and that's brilliant um, but there were other continuity issues in there there was a lot of recapping of old information from Shenmue 2 I, I do wonder what the trigger for that was whether it was a deliberate thing to recap things that happened previously to catch people up I know you had the digest video, but whether that was a thing, or simply that the writers they had didn't really go too far away from the novels and almost sort of rehashed them. I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm just being a little bit sort of yeah. not critical. It's the wrong word, but I want to sort of analyse the story content of Shenmue through in the context of the answers that we got. Yeah, no, I do, I do get that, Mike. It's like it's kind of like potentially back in the day for Shenmue two, like your big reveal is like. <gasps> Zhao Shenming, that, that's the name of Landy's father or whatever, and Long mm. Sun Zhao, you know, all this, these sort of things. Yeah, where they, yeah. they kind of make a big deal of that at the end of Shemu 3, as though it's introducing new information to the player. Perhaps that just happened to have been in that part of the novel, and when they were creating Shemu 2, for example, they were taking elements from like future things, and someone thought that, oh, well, that, that reveal would be a really good reveal right now, and then depending on the continuity-wise, they are that process that they're going through when they're creating new Shenmue games. Like you say, maybe because some of the original team members aren't there to say, well, you know, that that line's already been used in Shenmue 2, like that big reveal is, you know, perhaps they sort of glanced over that without thinking. And then in the novelized version of this chapter that they're, they're currently reading through to design the game around, it says, oh, Long Sun Zhao is Landy's, you know, real name or whatever. And it's, yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah. like, oh, you know, this has to be a, a big moment in the game and then obviously when it is it doesn't really hit because it's not a big moment it's already been told in Shenmue 2 so yeah there's these a few little disparages between potential things there that could have been fine-tuned to like better introduce things or better um, create that sort of big moment that doesn't kind of fall flat because it's not a big moment um, yeah and it's not and again, I, I pr pr sort of put a preface in front of it that I don't want to come across as being overly critical. It's just I find it quite interesting yeah, in, in the context of, of, of the novels being there and what was actually produced in the game. And I, and I still stand by. I think it would be helpful to have somebody on the team who, who knows those games inside out, who can go, right, at point X in Shenmue 2, this was done. So yeah. actually in Shenmue 3, 4, you don't need to do this. You need to push it forward by doing what whatever. And mm. then then I think you can just drive that story forward again. But again, also, I think coming into screenwriters and having people that I think are experts in that area would also help benefit a fourth, fifth game in in that point of view. I'm going to move on because we've, we've, yeah, I don't want to do Shem, you know, Shemmy 3. I keep talking about that we should, should move on from it, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to practice what I preach and, and move straight on into the next question. Um, and this one's very interesting, and it's about the uh, motion capture of Shenmue 3. And you ask, could you tell us about the motion capture process for Shenmue 3? We heard it was all done in-house. Yeah, so we kind of had a, an outline of an idea of like where this question, this next series of questions was going to go. We were looking to like see like if they were going to sort of expand upon this in a Shenmue 4, for example. So start a question here. Yu Suzuki's answer says, not all of it was carried out here. Some was also outsourced. It's, uh, yeah, interesting. I did, I'm not sure if we knew that, did we? No, we, we're under the presumption that it was all done at WiseNet. It does make yeah. sense they would have outsourced some of it. I'd like to I, I know what they outsourced and what they didn't outsource. I, I don't know, but mm -hmm. it's interesting they did manage to outsource some of it. And then coming on to the next question, you said, was the in-house capture done in that area? You point to a nearby room. Yeah, so obviously we got this image that we were actually showing to you, Suzuki, from... Um, switch his laptop just to sort of give him a bit of context of why we were asking that. So obviously it looks like this motion capture in this image 
is in WiseNet Studios. And I was actually looking through the window of the meeting room and it kind of resembled this image that I was looking at here. So obviously the building that we're in, but you know, these floors must look at, you know, quite identical. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you know, might it have been over there that you were doing this motion capture? And he actually turned around and he, he, he thought about it for a moment and he's like, mm, I don't think so. I think it was done on the floor below us. So, um, yeah, obviously they, they had two floors, didn't they, when they were working yes, on Shamu 3? <laughs> they did, because obviously the amount of staff they'd had working on that project. And yeah. I, I like how you sort of led into the Shenmue 4 motion capture yeah. question here, asking essentially, would the mocap for Shenmue 4 be handled differently? Yeah, so we were sort of like ex trying to get an answer that may lead into like, oh yeah, we'd like to introduce throw moves again or whatever, you know, that sort of yeah. thing, if yeah, we could yeah. do it differently. So Yusuzuki said that with Shenmue 3, we did do a lot of the motion capture using a magnetic detection system. And motion capture technology has advanced now. So for Shenmue 4, we would probably use optical detection. It means nothing to me. I don't know if that's... Yeah, I haven't got a clue. You know, massive technolo technology or advancement or whatever. He says he, we would do the prototyping here and then outs outsource for the final. Um, there are things that still need to be done in-house, though. When striking someone, they are going to get hit, right? But I want to see that reaction when they get hit. This was hilarious, actually. So what he was doing, I'll try and kind of do the same sort of thing in, in the picture here. But he, he physically like put his fist like this, and he was crunching off his face like this right in front of us. <laughs> like, this is this is mental. Yu Suzuki's like doing this. So he's demonstrating a slow motion punch to his own cheek and humorously dis distorts his face sort of like that. And he said actually hitting someone would be dangerous, so he can't use full contact during motion capture. So we create those kind of effects in-house using manual or physically based rendering. And this is what he wants. So again, he gives us a second demonstration. He, this is the kind of thing that he wants to see. So I guess when you think about, say, I'm, I'm trying to think of like games that may do that similar sort of thing. Maybe Mortal Kombat is probably a little bit too brutal. But you know when you can physically <laughs> see the yeah, yeah, yeah. the punch of um, he kind of wants to show I guess the the force of what a character punching someone in the face would look like. So that sort of distortion is perhaps this technology technology advancement that he's, he's talking about, where it might be easier to sort of to sh to show that now without physically punching someone in the face. You've got the tools to be able to create something that looks like someone's punching something in the face, and uh, yeah. I made a note there that it well, it, it caused a bit of laughter in the room, which was, <laughs> which it did. We were all sort of laughing at that. Just we, we, I, I wish that was a moment where I was like, oh, do I ask you Suzuki if it's okay if I take a photo of him doing this thing with his face? But I thought it was a bit, maybe could seem a bit disrespectful to put that on the internet that <laughs> you Suzuki sort of crunched up punching face. <laughs> Shows he's got a good sense of humor though. Yeah, wow. I mean, and it, honestly, uh... he was so lovely. And just so comfortable around us, you know, he, he was cracking jokes like this. And I know it kind of like had to be translated by Joel into English. Yeah, and then, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. But just to sort of feel comfortable to, to crack a couple of jokes, he's he's quite a humorous guy, actually, which is uh, nice. And I think it strikes the tone of the interview from sort of the, the, the sort of discussion we've had so far that actually, while it's quite, you know, for the dojo, it's a big deal, this this thing. And it's a massive deal meeting Yu Suzuki and, and doing an interview. Actually, it sounds like it was conducted in quite a relaxed, informal way, for want yeah, of a better word. It really was, man. And considering it was like my first in-person interview like that, that just helped so much that I, I didn't feel like I was under pressure or like if I, I screwed up a, asking a question, someone was, you know, it was going to make me look unprofessional. Um, just everything just felt so relaxed and it was just a, a nice environment to to actually do this interview in without feeling pressured. You know, like you see, like when we went to Monaco and these kind of in, in, in interviews going on on the stage, like having that that in interview in front of all that audience would be absolutely terrifying for me. So like in this environment, I, I just felt so comfortable, which is, uh, you know, just, uh, again, it, it's just expressing my thanks that that, that was the case and Yu Suzuki and Joel just made us feel so so comfortable in that in that environment. And it, it shows in the answers that we get, I think, as we 
go through. Mm. Moving moving away, and then we're going to talk about a little bit about the Shenmue 3 Kickstarter. Um, we see a stretch reward for Bailu Village called the Magic Maze, and a development video showing clips of boulders falling onto Rio. And there's the pictures on the site if you want to see them. Uh, could you tell us what was planned for this? Yeah, so we're trying to sort of dig deep into what would have been planned beyond the budget of Shenmue 3 a little bit. Um, so he says the magic maze was to have been a procedurally generated maze. I don't remember off and what was planned, but it's something that could be applied to a forest area or equally to a rocky area. It's something that can't be made completely random as that would be difficult to design around. But in general, the shape of the forest would be created using splines. For example, a realistic foliage would be generated automatically. So kind of similar to what actually they did for the the, the forest segment of Shemu mm. 2, how they sort of compressed everything by being able to procedurally generate the, the forest on the fly there. Uh, I think that's kind of a similar thing he's sort of saying there. And it also reminds me a little bit of the uh, the rooms in Kowloon. They're, mm. they're, oh, they're generated as that door opens, aren't they? Which yep. again, at the time, the technology for that was insane. Um, so it sounds like they were trying to utilise at least some of that idea for something like that obviously didn't come to fruition unfortunately and it comes into the next question where you ask was there a particular event planned for the magic maze he says yes but i don't recall the details but the, there would have been something planned for it and that's interesting like I'd, I'd love to know what that would have been like for example when you think back to the kickstarter you can see um rio looking over like the the two loose for example so could there have been mm. a section where he's having to dodge rocks to get to the two loose, or I, I know I'm throwing things out there because I know it's all been, it was in a test element at that point in time. Yeah. I wonder where they'd have put it. I don't know. Yeah, would have been interesting. So then, coming straight into again another sort of question around Shenmue Three development, uh, there was other sort of mini games that were cut, and you make reference to there was a mini game called Ring Toss and the remote control forklift. Boats so again. There's the picture from which was from a Kickstarter update. I can't remember which one, but we've mm-hmm. covered it in our one of the Kickstarter update shows we've done. But any of these are originally going to be playable? Yeah. So if you remember, there was also like music files found in the the Shemu yes. through files that was like RC forklift and RC boat. So they they had a few extra mini games. So yeah, we were curious what actually happened to these. And Yusuke was actually so he was pointing at the board on the the screenshot here that we we showed him and he he was saying wasn't this one in there and then he says i I guess not since you're asking about it so it must have been close whatever they were working with the ring toss maybe he was thinking like maybe pale toss or Mm. a a similar sort of mini game because they did create quite a few different pale toss-esque mini games so maybe you just assumed that the ring toss one would would have been part of that yeah absolutely and then you sort of you come onto this here so there's a ring toss board in the game but it's not not playable. Mm. And then he kind of started to remember. He's like, yeah, we, we started making it, but it must have been dropped partway through. And then he was telling us a little bit about the forklift. He says, for that, of the forklift game, there was even a proper engine inside the vehicle that could be controlled, and you had to collect balloons and carry them all to a certain spot. <laughs> so that, that that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's interesting. I'd be quite interested to play that, actually. Yeah, me too. Um, and then the next question around that is, was there a working prototype created for the remote control forklift game, which he said, yes, there was. Yes, and there I was, want to know, yeah. I want to know where that prototype ended up because I want to play it. Yeah, but well, if I you think about it, they, they created the full-on forklift experience, didn't they, with a part-time True. job? So, I mean, I mean, could that have just been miniaturized a little bit and Maybe. turned into a bit of a game? Maybe that that's what the pr- the prototype. It reminds me of you know when you go to like an, an amusement park and you put a pound coin in those yeah yeah yeah, yeah. steering wheel things and you got like the little RC cars and stuff like that that you can crash into which that that sort of thing is is what that kind of reminded me of. So whether or not that would have worked in Bailey Village, but I don't know. I don't know. I also wonder whether they took that sort of basis from that remote control forklift game and made it into the the forklift yeah, true. job potentially. Could have been the other way around, right? Like they they started off with an RC forklift and then they were like, well, why don't we just turn this into a full fledged forklift part time job mini game? Maybe that's what they Makes decided to do instead. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Now the next question is, I think, very interesting. This has been a this is topic a of debate over the Shenmue community since Shenmue 3's release and you go and ask uh, there's a Shenmue tree outside Shenhua's house 
There's also a large tree in the area called Tanari Spring. Is that also a Shenmue tree? Yeah, so if you remember in the game, in the English, I think they do call it a Shenmue tree. They do. And I believe Switch was saying that in the Japanese, it's not really clear that it's a Shenmue tree. It's just a, another tree kind of thing in the, in the Japanese dialogue. So that's hence this question. And Yusuke said, yes, it is. And there are also some in Liyuang, which is interesting. So mm. there's not just one Shemu tree, the, the one in Turnery Spring is. And then that there's some in Liyuang, which kind of makes sense thinking of the one in the flashback as well. That Now we know that that yeah. is Liyuang. That is one of the Shemu trees as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then he, he goes to draw some Chinese characters on, a, on yeah. a piece of paper, which I find really interesting. This is interesting. I mean, he has done this a couple of times in the past. I don't know... It's not really new information for Shemu fan because this is how the flashback goes. It's sort of told like this that these Chinese characters are pronounced Shamu, and that's how Shemu is written. And then the second character of the, the Chinese kanji means tree, uh, which is kind of how it gets its name. And if that is replaced by the other character for flower, it becomes Shenhua. So that, that's kind of what the parents actually say in that flashback the Shemu trees in full bloom. You know, what shall we name her? The, the, the leaf's called Shemfa. Why don't we name her Shemfa kind of thing, don't we? And that's kind of where that comes from. But to see him actually write it out um, is pretty cool. He, 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 oh, yeah. he had like these bits of paper that he was like scribbling little notes on for us to show us that you'll see a couple more of later in the interview. Brilliant. I like that, I like that a lot. And then so the final question around this is uh, in a cut scene, Rio uh, talks about a special connection with the tree outside the Hazuki Dojo. And then you ask, is that tree a Shenmue tree? Yeah, so this, this, I don't think we actually had this written on the interview, but with him saying that this is a tree, that's a tree, the one in Liu Yuang's tree, I was like, this is like a great time to ask him to, to get a clear answer now. Is the Hazuki Dojo tree a Shenmue tree? And then he said, that's just a cherry tree. <laughs> so it isn't, basically. I completely debunked that one, but yeah. that's, that's absolutely fine. It's what we're here for. Uh, the next question is going into a little bit of spoiler territory. Uh, there's obviously the scene in Shenmue 3 with Yang Lang. Uh, he's interrogated by Shenhua. And you outright ask him, what did she do to make him talk? Yeah, and Yusuke just smiles and says that's a secret. So I guess we still don't know whether we'll, we'll ever know. I don't know. <laughs> I hope we do. I, I really do. because uh, yeah. The fact that he was screaming by the end of that, I'd love to know what she did to him. Uh, the next question, again, we're in sort of spoiler territory perhaps a little bit but again something that was discussed and there was also the translation error with the scroll at the end of mm. Shenmue 3 here uh, on the scroll found in the bell tower in Bailu village there is an image of Niawu what is the reason that, that Niawu is on that scroll yeah so a bit of context behind this question obviously after the Niawu image you've got the cliff temple depicted or you know the, these trees that might be where the, the treasure's hidden but the Niawu image to be on such an ancient scroll doesn't really have any answers to it if you know what i mean like it kind of feels more like it's just a gamified way of sending the characters to niawi right it's like forcing them oh because it's on the scroll you must go to niawi but actually nothing really happens in niawi that means anything in regarding to like this ancient scroll so that was the, the reasoning behind the question is like why actually is niawi on the scroll and then I don't know if you can kind of work out what he means here, Matt. It's a little bit confusing, but he says the Chiyu men had to be prevented from finding out about Niawu's connection with the two mirrors. So a hint was left in the scroll. So I don't know if that is an answer or not. It had me thinking that perhaps in Shemu as a game format, maybe the Cliff Temple is actually still in Niawu. Like, instead of having Li Yuang or the Shaolin Temple or Shanghai or, you know, another location where this cliff temple is, um, potentially it could just be an extension of Niawu. I don't know. I was I was trying to think, like, what, what he could actually mean by this. I'm not sure. And without, I think, the true ending that they wanted for Shenmue 3, I don't think... It doesn't quite line up. Hmm. I can't, I can't interpret that in a way that will make sense. If I, if, yeah, I'm a little yeah. confused by that. 
Chi Yu Men had to be prevented from finding out about Niao Wu's connection with the two mirrors, so a hint was left in the scroll. But then, in Niao Wu, it doesn't really make a connection with the mirrors, does it? it? I know you lose the Phoenix mirror, obviously, to Niao Sun, you've got the fake mirror that Ren throws at Lan Di. But there's no real reference to the mirrors in Niao Wu, so I wonder, is that something they may have left out by, you know, just by sheer virtue of time? Hmm. Or do the do they, they they think there's some sort of a connection to Niao Wu? Um, the, the fact that it. The fact that Niao Sun's there, or um, you know, Landy's castle's there. I don't know. Mm, I'm not sure about that one. Maybe yeah. we'll find out in a, in a later Shenmue game, but it's I don't think that's immediately clear in, in my mind, at least. So I'd be interested to see what other people think about that. Aren't yeah, well. leave your comments below on that one, guys. Yeah, do you got your, quite, your quite interpretation of that? Point. Mm -hmm. uh, next bit uh, at the end of Shenmue 2, there's a cutscene in the stone pit in which Shenhua reads the letter left for her by her father, tells her to find the proof. Is this scroll? I like this question. Is this scroll from the bell tower the proof that he was referring to? Yeah, because again, fan debates, right? This is the proof the scroll. It's something we've been debated about, and, and Yu Suzuki actually says that he's not talking about the scroll. He's referring to her meeting Ryo and accompanying him to solve the mystery together. Mm. So again, make of that as what you will. So we sort of followed up with a little short question here, just asking, so this proof hasn't been found yet. And Yusuke sort of agreed, like he says, that that's right. So we haven't actually discovered the proof yet that Shenfor's father was talking about. She's very, very interesting as to what that proof is or isn't going to be. Um, yeah, because that, like you say, is a theory that they found the proof, the scroll, and they need where to go. But actually, they haven't found anything yet by the sounds of it. They've just been told where to go. Yeah, but then now that they've found Shenfor's father, could you not tell him? <laughs> well, you'd hope so, wouldn't you? You'd think he'd probably know. But yeah, so what's that proof that's... you're talking about, uh, Yuan? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Yuan? Maybe we'll find out in Shenmue 4. Um, this next question and the next few questions sort of touch on, I think, some of the law streams that you've done and the research mm -hmm. around that. And I know we've talked about this in um, in streams and podcasts, etc. as well. It says here that Shenmue 3 touches on the Emperor and his commissioning of the mirrors. Is the Emperor based on the real-life Emperor at the time, uh, Emperor uh, Pu Yi of the Qing Dynasty, the so-called Last Emperor? Yeah, really, it's just something personal. I wanted to find out if the game was based on this emperor that because it seems to, to 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 be mentioned a few times in the game the important thing is that the, the emperor would have only been four at the time so mm. i just kind of wanted a bit of conf confirmation beyond that so you said yes he is the model on which the game's emperor is based i mean that's in keep very much in keeping with with shenmue and the sort of the, yep. using the real life aspects to build into the game so I, that makes a lot of sense you've got a photo there of the three-year-old Puyi in 1909 and then the follow-up question is in real life at the time of the mirror commissioning in 1910 he would only have been four years old is that the case in the game as well yeah interesting answer from Yusuke he says he doesn't recall this precise age I guess he means at this time but the dates and so on are something that we carefully researched on our side so in that sense then he is four years old in the game if they mm. carefully researched it because you know we've sort of found that information out since then that the emperor at the time of this this event happening in 1910 he would have been four years old so that's an interesting point because if you think that the emperor by de you know that the envoy came by decree of the emperor that the, the characters in Shenmue mm -hmm. 3 say and oishi san in the antique shop says he once read a book about the emperor you know wanting these phoenix and dragon mirrors being made and then it kind of adds an extra layer when you actually think that this guy, this emperor, is only four years old <laughs> when he's coming up with these sort of demands. So, um, yeah, hopefully that that's something that they touch upon in the future. Would be good to see if they can expand on that as to who really sort of commissioned it. But we'll hopefully come on to that in another game. The next question, quite a straightforward answer, but again, sort of reaffirms, I think, what was discussed a little bit earlier. So in the ending scene of the game, Rio leaves Niawu by boat together with Wen and Shenhua and her father. Where are they heading to next? This is a good answer, I thought, because, the, again, I know we did get conf confirmation of this in one of the early questions, but Yu Suzuki out, out, outright saying that the next destination that the, the characters are heading to is Shuzo. So there we are. That mm. rock-solid 
proof. We found the proof of where we're going next. <laughs> Maybe the proof is in Shuzo. It might well be. Um, so then the next question sort of is about the story DLC. And Zhang shows up in Niawu. Uh, and you ask, is he there on the orders of Yuandazu to watch over Rio? Or is there a coincidence that he was there when Rio was there? Yeah, I thought this was just a fun question to ask if there was any real design motive behind Zhang showing up in Shemu 3. And Yu Suzuki said that Zhang is a bit of a fan favourite, so I really just wanted to include him in the DLC. And then we all sort of laughed at that answer because it was like, <laughs> you know, as though as though there was no real reasoning behind Zhang being there other than that mm. he's a sort of a fan favourite. But then he did reply after that more seriously that, of course, you know, he would have been sent there from the instructions of Yuanda Zoo. Now that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very, very interesting. Why would Zhu send Zhang there? Now, going back to the Shenmue Master interviews, it talks about that Yuanda Zhu isn't all that he seems, that he's not necessarily to be trusted. So what's his motive here? Why is he sending Zhang on to monitor the situation with the Chi Yu men, Rio? Too convenient, I don't know. isn't it? Yeah, very, very convenient. What's what's going on there? And hopefully in a fourth game, we might get more around Zoo and what his motivations are. I know there's a theory that Zoo is also Tente, and that's been talked about for years. So that's that's quite an interesting answer that we've got confirmation that Zoo was the one that commissioned that, that to happen. And then the last question of, of the Shenmue 3 stretch is, again, I think this is really interesting in itself mm, yep. and might... Feed, the answer can feed into a video I did a little while ago. But you ask, I'm showing a picture here, can we expect the story of Zhuing and Zimming from starting Shenmue 2 to be continued in future games? Yeah, I'd, I'm not quite sure how to take this answer, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but he says it might be too much of a stretch to be able to include it in the main story, but possibly as something like a side story, which when I first heard that answer, I was a little bit disappointed, like, you know, because... The relationship between Shu Ying and Ziming was like such a big pivotal moment in the, the storyline of Shemu 2, and it felt like, especially with Ryo having the half of the pendant still in his inventory, that there was a, a very much a big reveal going to happen in the future of Ziming. And maybe there is, maybe this is what Yusuzuki means, that the actual relationship between Shu Ying and Ziming could be something like a side story. But it's 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 I don't know how do how do you see that answer, Matt? Is that is that Yu Suzuki saying that they haven't got time to cover Zimming and Shuing again, or do you think he's he's talking specifically about the relationship between them that could be a side story rather than them appearing in the game again? I I would question whether he's got time within the resources and the games he's got to explore that fully. Yeah. So I wonder whether there will still be some element of it in there, given the chapter cards as well and. A zooming type figures in there you've got the side story comics which i mentioned i think ali mentioned this in a, in a stream i did a video on it that actually they could do some of this through um through side story comics if they really wanted to sort of build that up into a shenmue 4 cover some of that lore nice and early you could charge a few quid for it we'd buy it you make a little bit of money happy days for everybody right yeah. but so that could work in that sense i wonder whether you'll get as much of that background in in the game potentially they might have some flashbacks they might have little bits and pieces but if zimming appears i think it'd be much more focused on the here and now with little tidbits of what happened hmm. with with him and and Ewing. and it's intimated in the chapter cast that Ewing returns as well so how yeah. they play that into it is another question um, but I think they will probably spend more time on the here and now. They can't not use that pendant. It would make no sense in the story point at this juncture to just sort of wreck on it because it's there. It's a massive point. It's in the inventory. It's a massive, massive point. You've still got the photos as well. I, 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 they, if they wreck on that, that's a big storyline they wreck on. I think what they'll end up doing is play, focusing it very much on what Rio's doing at that precise moment in time and maybe fill in some gaps through flash flashbacks and maybe some side story comics as well which again would if they want to build hype for a shen before they could start doing that now and that would work quite nicely whether they get permission to do it i don't i don't know but i thought that answer was very interesting i think some some fans may sort of run jump off a cliff and overreact to it a little <laughs> bit 
that they may not be covering it in the same way that we potentially hoped and I can understand it to a point we also don't know what they plan to do with it and I think we need to let that play out a little bit in terms of what they're looking at to to sort of push that forward my view is it's the here and now and the the wording like I say the the contrast between the the words main story and side story maybe it was only ever going to be a side story anyway it kind of is just a side Mm. story in the grand scheme of things the shooing and zimming narrative though um, maybe what he's saying there is they haven't got enough time. It, you know, it would take more Shenmue games to to really integrate that as a main story element. So it could just be a side story element, and you know, doesn't take the center stage perhaps like it would have done back in the day. But it's still going to be yeah. something that exists. Yeah, and I could I could see that actually. That makes a lot a lot of sense. That they just don't, if they obviously had an unlimited budget and massive amount of games, then they could probably give it more and more focus and attention. But I think you're right. I think it will be part of something but not detract away from the main story Mm. right that brings us to the end of Shenmue 3 now